My name is Gopala Vasudevan. Today we'll talk about Chapter 2 and Chapter 2 deals with the international flow of funds. So basically here, what are some of the things we want to talk about? We will talk about the key components of the balance of payment. We will talk about how international trade flows are influenced by economic factors and other factors. And finally, we'll talk about how international capital flows are influenced by country characteristics. So before we do that, I just want to go back and uh, talk about a conversation between Larry Summers and Christine Romer. So Larry Summers was the Treasury Secretary under President Obama. He was also the President of Harvard University and he was also a Professor in Economics at Harvard. Uh, Christine Romer was the Head of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama Administration and they had this conversation when Christine Romer was heading towards a Senate hearing to be confirmed as the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. Currently, Christine Romer is a faculty member. She's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Okay. So on the way to the Senate hearing, uh, Larry Summers was asking her, what do you think about the value of the dollar? Should the government control the value of the dollar or should it be controlled by the Federal Reserve. So when he asked this question, Christine Romer's answer was, the exchange rate is a price much like any other price and is determined by market forces. So just like we talk about the price of an iPhone or the price of a house or the price of a car, basically what her answer was, the exchange rate is the price of the currency. And just like anything else, that should be determined based upon supply and demand. Uh, when he heard this, Larry's answer was, you're wrong. The exchange rate is the purview of the Treasury. The US is in favor of a strong dollar. So basically, even though this was 2008, at a time when the economy had crashed, we had a serious financial crisis, basically Larry Summers' answer was, we want to make sure that we have a strong dollar. And this is an article that came in the New York Times, written by Christine Romer, and she was looking at a couple of scenarios. The first one, suppose American entrepreneurs create many products that foreigners want to buy and start many companies that want to invest in, what will happen to the dollar? So in this case, what we are saying is that a lot of uh, new products are coming in the US and these are very attractive and there's a high chance that foreigners might be interested in buying these products. So in this case, chances are there is going to be a strong demand for these products, which basically means that there's going to be a high demand for the US dollar. So in this case, you can expect the US dollar to go up. And basically, this was uh, the scenario pointed out by Christine Romer, and she was clearly referring to the time when President Bill Clinton was the president, both of them are Democrats, and she was talking about the large-scale innovation that is going on in the US, and because of that, the economy was strong and the dollar was strong. Now, she also pointed out a second case, and suppose the US runs a large budget deficit that causes domestic interest rates to rise, what will happen to the dollar? So in this case, there is a, a deficit, large deficit, because of which the government has to borrow money. And in this case, because they are borrowing more money, you can expect interest rates to rise. And what, what do you think will happen to the dollar? So here, higher American interest rates make both foreigners and Americans want to buy more American bonds and fewer foreign bonds. The reason being that now it's more attractive to keep your money in the US and buy US Treasury bonds. So the demand for dollars increases and the supply decreases and the price of the do dollar will again rise. So basically here she's talking about this with reference to the time when President Reagan came into power. At the time, the economy was not well, doing good. And on top of that, there were tax cuts put in by President Reagan. And we also had to spend a lot of mon money on the military, mainly because of the Cold War. So because to curb inflation, uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Walker 
basically he increased the interest rate and partly because of that the US dollar was very strong so basically what we are saying is that we have two scenarios is a strong dollar good or bad in a strong economy in a weak economy so basically what we are saying is that if the economy is weak like we had after 2008 having a strong dollar can actually hurt us and the reason why it can hurt us is because our exports will go down so as the price of the US dollar grows up US companies have to increase the price of their products which makes them less competitive so whenever the economy is weak it means that companies produce less items and they're going to hire fewer people so that's going to be bad for the economy on the other hand if the economy is strong if the US already has a high level of employment unemployment levels are low in that case it might help to have a strong dollar simply because by having a strong dollar we can uh, perhaps it makes it cheaper to import products from outside countries okay so that's what we see here uh, whether you want a strong dollar or whether you want a weak dollar depends upon the economy when the economy is weak you don't want to have a strong currency it actually curbs uh, employment it can curb exports and curbs employment on the other hand if it is weak when the economy is strong it makes sense to have a strong dollar okay? now let's go back to the to chapter we want to talk about the different components okay so the first one is the balance of payment and what is the balance of payment that basically tells you it's a summary of the transactions between domestic and foreign residents for a specified country over a specified period of time so usually what we look at is we look at the transactions over three months over six months over one year and so on okay and in this case the current account is a summary of the flow of funds due to purchases of goods or services or the provision of income on financial assets so there are two components here that we're talking about first is purchase of goods or services and the second is provision of income on financial assets so as an example Walmart might be importing some products from China so that is a outflow to purchase a good that's an example another example would be uh, investors abroad are buying the US bonds in this case the US government has to make payments on the bonds so that would be a provision of income on financial assets now the second component is the capital account and that is a summary of the flow of funds resulting from the sale of assets between one specified country and all other countries over a period of time okay so basically here we're talking more about uh, the sale of assets which means that we are talking about real assets so either some some company perhaps from abroad is buying assets in the US or perhaps the US companies are buying companies and so on from other countries so as an example and house Bush is perhaps the biggest beer company definitely in the US and perhaps the world and not too long ago it is owned by a family based in St. Louis that is the Bush family but some time back that was taken over and currently it is owned by InBev which is a Brazilian beer company so that's what we see in this case we have a purchase of assets and because of that there is a flow of funds okay now when you look at the current account there are three parts to that the first is payments for merchandise and services okay that's the first part the second is factor income payments so that would be interest payments and dividends payments the third one is transfer payments so these are gifts made by either US nationals to other countries or uh, other people sending gifts to the US okay so here we have quite a few examples the first one is JC Penney purchases stereos produced in Indonesia that it will sell in the US retail stores so what is that in this case JC Penney is a US company they are buying products from outside which means that it's a cash outflow and that is going to be a debit as far as the balance of payment accounts is concerned let's look to next one the Mexican government pays a US consulting firm for consulting services produced by the firm provided by the firm so what we see here is that the US is very well known for their service industry and maybe for consulting 
a Mexican government is paying a U.S. company, that could be an IBM, that could be an HP, and so on, a payment. So that is going to be a cash inflow, and that is a credit and the balance of payments. The next one uh, we want to look for is a U.S. bookstore uh, in Ireland, sorry, a university bookstore in Ireland purchases textbooks provided by a U.S. publishing company. So that's a foreign entity purchasing goods from the U.S. That is going to be a cash inflow and that is going to be a credit as far as the accounts are concerned. Now we want to talk about international income transactions. A U.S. investor uh, receives a dividend payment from a French firm in which she purchased stock. So what we see here is that we are talking about factored income payments. Okay, So that is the second component. And in this case, it is a U.S. investor investing in a foreign stock. And when they receive the dividend, that is a cash inflow. And that is a credit as far as the accounts are concerned. Uh, the next one is a Mexican company that borrowed dollars from a bank based in the U.S. sends an interest payment to that bank. Okay, So uh, the U.S. is the lender. And when they receive the interest, that's going to be a cash inflow. Now we want to talk about the third component. And that is we want to talk about transfer payments. So transfer payments, some examples are the gifts. And here the U.S. Uh, provides aid to Costa Rica in response to a flood in Costa Rica. So that is the gift being given by U.S. nationals or perhaps the U.S. government to a foreign country. And that is a cash outflow. And that is a debit as far as the balance of payment is concerned. So what we have here is that we have a summary of the current account in the year 2008. And what do we see here? So the first is U.S. exports of merchandise. That is 1,148 billion. U.S. exports of services is 497 billion. U.S. income receipts, that is 818. So all of them together add up to 2,463 billion dollars. And U.S. imports of merchandise is 1,967. U.S. imports of services is 378. And U.S. income payments are 737. Okay. So what we see here is that it talks about the U.S. imports and income payment. And what we see is that there is a difference between the exports of the U.S., which is 2,463 billion, and what we actually imported, that is much higher, that is 3,082. Now, the net transfer by the U.S. is 112, and the current account is the total U.S. exports and income receipts minus the U.S. imports and income payments minus the net transfers. So that is a negative 731. Okay. So that basically shows that we are importing a lot more products than we are exporting. Now, next, we want to talk about the capital and financial accounts. And what are the different components? The first is direct foreign investment. So one example would be companies from outside buying companies in the U.S. We talked about Anheuser-Busch being purchased. The second would be portfolio investment. So they are investing in securities. The third one is other capital investment. So one example would be foreign entities investing in U.S. treasuries, or that would be the money market. And the last one is we have errors and omissions. And what does it mean? Basically, what it tells you is that the negative current account may not be the same as the positive capital and financial account. So there could be some mismatch. And because of that, we have a fourth component, that is the errors and omissions. So what I have here is that we basically talk about the distribution of U.S. exports and imports in 2008. And what we see here is that most of our exports okay, were to our neighbors. So to Canada, we exported 20% of, uh, of our exports. To Mexico, that is 12%. Okay. So 32% of our exports are with our closest neighbors. Then we have Germany, 4%. We have UK, 4%. France is 2%, and so on. Okay. To China, we export 5%. Now, what about the imports? With our imports, again, what we find is that we have a lot of trade with our closest neighbors, that is Canada and Mexico. So 16% of our imports are from Canada, and 10% are from Mexico. But when you look at the imports, 
what we also see is that 16 percent of our imports so the largest imports other than Canada is with China and that's one of the problems that we have that is we export a lot less to China when compared to our imports you know uh, here what when you look at the international trade flows to summarize the graphs we saw basically what it tells you is that Canada, China, Mexico and Japan are the key exporters to the US and the US balance of trade trend has grown substantially over time okay so it's not very good for the US and what is the impact here that could potentially lead to higher US unemployment but the benefit is that it can also lead to more efficient production okay basically what we are saying is that based upon what we talked about in chapter one we talked about the competitive uh, law of competitive advantage so the factor of production is going to those countries where perhaps that can be best done perhaps at the lowest cost and where production is most efficient okay now what are some of the events that increased international trade the first is the removal of the berlin wall so this was the wall separating east germany and west germany so that was clearly a very big symbol and it increased the trade between east germany and west germany it made them a more powerful country the second is the single european act of 1987 again it unified europe and it made trade within those countries uh, more efficient uh, the other things are the north american free trade agreement that is between the u.s Initially, that was in Mexico, Canada, and now it has expanded to bring in a lot of other countries. And basically, that enabled a lot more trade between the U.S. and the closest neighbors. Now, what else do we have? We have the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, that is the GATT. Other factors are the inception of the euro, so that is having a single currency for euro definitely increase the international trade and encourage trade between the European countries and also the European countries were able to come up with a currency that would rival the US dollar then we had the expansion of the European Union more uh, countries joined the European Union and finally we also had other trade agreements that encourage trade between these countries okay now what are some of the trade frictions you see the first one is environmental restrictions so basically here what we are saying is that in the US the environment laws are quite strict and they say that you know companies for example cannot pollute uh, the rivers or the sea and so on they have to have a certain standard as far as the environmental concern is concerned and usually what that means is that that makes perhaps US companies less competitive when compared to companies that are operating in countries where the restrictions are less the second is labor laws and what we see is that in the US child labor is prohibited but there are other countries where although in theory it is prohibited in practice that is quite prevalent and again that means that these countries might have an unfair advantage and it, they might also not be doing something ethical as far as the trade is concerned the third factor is bribes so in some countries you know corruption is very rampant and mainly because of that when US companies operate in those countries they have to bribe the local officials now in the US clearly that is prohibited and partly because of this even now there is an arrest warrant in Nigeria against Dick Cheney who was the vice president and that there the concern is that when he was the CEO of Halliburton the company bribed some of the officials in Nigeria okay. now what is the fourth uh, trade friction that is government subsidies and what is that so for example if you look at Europe a, a few countries have come together to create the company that manufactures the Airbus and in this case uh, their main competitor is Boeing and Boeing is a private uh, is a publicly traded company that has stock and the owners are the stockholders and basically what Boeing says is that Airbus because they are supported by three governments they have an unfair advantage when compared to a publicly traded company so that is one example of a government subsidy creating an unfair advantage for 
some companies. Now, in recent times, U.S. companies have also complained that some of the bigger Chinese companies are owned by or pretty much backed by the Chinese government. And basically, what that means is that they will have an unfair advantage when compared to regular U.S. companies that try to compete with them. Okay. Now, what else is there? for trade friction would be tax breaks. So some countries give more tax incentives to some of the industries, which means that those industries can compete more effectively against foreign companies that may not have such tax breaks or subsidies. Okay. Now, what about trade policies? So what are some of the ways in which countries uh, might compete with different types of trade policies. The first one is using the exchange rate as a policy. So we talked about 2008. So in 2008, the US government decided to let the US dollar go down in value. And the reason being that they wanted to make US companies more competitive in the markets. And by bringing the value of the US dollar down, they were able to do that. A second example is outsourcing. So right now in the US, there has always been a hue and cry about outsourcing of jobs to India, to China, and so on. And basically, uh, you know, the Obama government, for example, has said that we will try to close the loopholes. We will try to make sure that companies that outsource the jobs do not get any tax breaks. So that's an example where the government is trying to take an action against outsourcing companies. Okay. Now, uh, managerial decisions about outsourcing. So I think the textbook talks about a case where uh, a person who owns a Japanese car and you know, who buys a lot of products from China is basically saying that he's against outsourcing. Okay, so what we see here is that in this case, although he's not directly doing it, indirectly by encouraging products from outside countries, he's perhaps encouraging outsourcing. Okay. But what we see is that right now, although outsourcing has been very uh, common to very recently, right now U.S. companies are trying to bring the jobs back to the U.S., mainly because they find that outsourcing is not a very effective strategy. Uh, what else do we see? Other examples are using trade policies for security reasons. So some examples are, not too long ago, a Middle Eastern company got the contract to run the ports in the U.S. So they would be managing the ports in New York, perhaps Chicago, and some of the other major ports around the country. At that point, some of the top senators and congressmen, they came together and they basically said that we do not want our security to be given to an outside company, especially one that comes from the Middle East that may not be very safe for the U.S. And basically, that contract was canceled. Okay, So that's an example where we are trying to turn a trade policy mainly for security reasons. Okay? And the last one is using trade policies for political reasons. So typically, whenever we have an election year, we find that most of the uh, candidates typically say that China is deliberately keeping their currency low. And they are doing that mainly for keeping their exports high. Now, this is mainly for political reasons to, you know, to appeal to the constituents rather than perhaps for any rational reasons. Okay. Now, what are some of the factors that affect the international trade flows? The first one is inflation. And what we see here is that usually as the uh, inflation goes up, we can expect the current account to decrease. Now, why does that happen? The main reason why that happens is because when we have high inflation, it also means that the prices of the goods produced are high in the U.S., which means that perhaps uh, companies as well as individuals might want to buy the same goods from other countries. And in this case, there is going to be an increase in the supply of the dollar. There's going to be an increase in the demand of foreign currencies. So this can decrease the current account. Now, the next one is national income. And here, what we are saying is that current account decreases if national income increases relative to other countries. So 
when the economy gets better, we are saying that the current account can go down. Now, the reason why this happens is because as the economy gets better, as the national income increases, it also means that people in the U.S. have more money and they want to import more products, perhaps luxury goods and so on, from other countries. So that is the reason why the current account can decrease. Now, we also want to talk about government policies. So what are some of the government policies that can affect international trade flows? The first one is subsidies for exporters. So India is very competitive in the software market. And one of the reasons why the software business has grown exponentially in India is because initially the government gave some subsidies for exporters. They gave tax breaks and so on. The second would be restrictions on imports. Now, in recent times, the value of the Russian currency has collapsed. It has decreased substantially against the US dollar. And to prevent further collapse of the currency, the Russian government has put restrictions on importing goods from other countries. Okay. Now, a third government policy that can affect the international trade flows is a lack of restriction on piracy. So whenever the governments do not have strong laws protecting piracy, that can hurt perhaps companies in foreign countries. So as an example, if you look at the software business, piracy is very common in the U India, which means that you can buy Microsoft Office or you can buy uh, some other software, including Adobe Flash and Adobe other products for very cheap prices, less than $10. And that typically hurts U.S. companies, which could make you know millions of dollars if the market protects the, uh, those companies' patents, copyrights, and discourages piracy. Okay. Now, what we have here is that, what is the effect of the exchange rate? We said that the current account decreases if currency depreciates, appreciates relative to other countries. And the reason why that happens is because as the exchange rate goes up, people want to import more products from outside because they have a strong currency, they can do that. Now, so as we said before, sometimes to encourage exports, what com uh, co uh, countries try to do is that they deliberately let the currency go down in value. Now, the question here is that, is it effective and in the long run and in the short run. Why is it that it may not be effective in the short run uh, as well as the long run? The first is counter pricing by competitors. So as an example, whenever the value of your currency goes down, let's say the US dollar goes down, it means that companies like Apple or GM or Microsoft, they can cut the price of the products they sell in other countries. Now, what does it mean as far as competition is concerned? If there are other companies from other countries competing against U.S. Uh, companies, it means that to stay in business, to be competitive, they will also cut the prices. Okay. This is what about the impact of other weak currencies. So what we are saying is that if the dollar goes down, chances are a lot of other uh, currencies might also go down, which means that those companies can also bring down the prices of their products. A third one is pre-arranged international transactions. So what we are saying here is that, let's say a U.S. airline, such as U.S. Air, is buying aircraft from uh, Airbus. Usually they buy, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of aircraft, and it takes time to produce an aircraft. So what that tells you is that the order could have been placed six months back or one year back, uh, which means that even when the home currency goes down, there may not be an immediate impact. It may take some time for the effect to be realized. And the last one is intra-company trade. So when you look at U.S. multinationals, they operate in different countries, and usually the subsidiaries might produce perhaps part of the components that go into a product and there could be a lot of trade taking place between the company and the subsidiaries. And usually what that means here is that even when the currency changes, when the exchange rate changes, the company may not stop trading with its subsidiaries. So here, what we see is that 
we have what is referred to as the J curve effect. And what the J curve effect tells you is that if, let's say, the US lets the dollar go down in value, what we might find is that in the short run, the US trade balance may not go up as expected, it might actually go down. And the reason why it might go down is because a lot of the transactions could be prearranged and nothing is going to change. But after that, you might find a positive effect, and that is the trade balance may improve because of the weaker currency. It makes the exports more competitive and it might actually discourage the imports from other countries. Now, we want to talk about a couple of things. One is, explain how the existence of the euro may affect the U.S. international trade. So, what is the effect of the having one currency, that is the euro? Okay. And now, if basically here, by having one currency, which is euro, what it means is that a lot of the countries that adopt this currency, they can trade between themselves. So, they don't have to trade with the U.S., and the main benefit of trading within themselves is because they don't have to worry about exchange rate risk. And the second is that the main reason why the European company, uh, countries came up with the euro was because they wanted to have a single currency. By joining together, they could have a single, perhaps powerful currency that could compete effectively against the U.S. dollar. So that was the motivation. And till perhaps very recently, that was realized. But in recent times, you know, we have the economic economic crisis in Europe, and that has uh, caused the value of the euro to depreciate substantially against the U.S. dollar. Okay. Now, assume that the dollar is presently weak and is expected to strengthen over time. How will these expectations affect the tendency of U.S. investors to invest in foreign securities? So in this case, we are talking about Europe, uh, U.S. nationals or perhaps U.S. companies. They are thinking about buying securities from abroad. So if the U.S. dollar is expected to strengthen, okay, let's say the euro is 1.3 and we expect it to go to 1.1. So the U.S. dollar is going to appreciate against the euro. So in such a scenario, U.S. investors may not wish to invest in foreign securities. And the reason being that, let's say they bought a security worth a thousand euros, the price they paid is at the current exchange rate of 1.3, they paid $1,300. When they get their money back, let's say the US dollar has appreciated, it's only 1.1. So even if they get the same thousand euros back, it's only worth 1100. So even if you add some interest to that, they're going to get a lot less money than what they spent. So that's the reason why you might find that U.S. investors may not prefer to invest in foreign securities if you expect the U.S. dollar to appreciate. On the other hand, if you expect the U.S. dollar to depreciate, we can expect the investors to invest more in other countries. And the reason being that when they convert their money back to the U.S., they're going to get more money. Okay. Explain why a strong dollar could enlarge the U.S. balance of trade, explain why a weaker dollar could affect the U.S. balance of trade deficit. I think we already talked about this before, but basically what we are saying is that if the U.S. dollar is strong, it means that U.S. companies may be less competitive when they export their products. At the same time, U.S. companies might also wish to import more from other countries because they have to pay less which together, what that means is that it's going to enlarge the U.S. balance of trade deficit. Now, the second part, explain why a weaker dollar could affect the U.S. balance of trade deficit. So, if the dollar is weak, it basically means that U.S. companies that export, they're going to be more competitive. So, Apple, let's say, sells uh, an iPhone for 600 euros, they can afford to bring it down to 550 if the U.S. dollar is going to weaken by maybe 10 percent. So in that case, exports are going to increase. At the same time, U.S. companies that import from abroad may not be that much interested in importing the products simply because they have to pay more in U.S. dollars. So together, it basically means that the trade deficit might go down. Now we want to talk about factors that affect direct foreign investment. So what are some of the factors that might affect the interest of foreign nationals to invest in the U.S. or U.S. companies to invest in foreign countries? So the first is 
changes in restrictions. So what we are saying is that whenever a foreign government brings down the restrictions on investment by foreign nationals, especially if the economy of those countries are doing well, there is a high chance that there could be higher investment by foreign nationals. So that can encourage the direct foreign investment. The second is privatization. So what we saw was that especially after the collapse of uh, Eastern European countries and what we find is that a lot of the government owned companies have been sold to the public. And in this case, if those are valuable investments, chances are investors from abroad will go and try to invest in those countries, invest in those companies. So that can encourage the direct foreign investment. The third one is potential economic growth. And what we are saying is that during the last decade, the main uh, places with high growth were Brazil, Russia, India, and China. So these are the BRIC countries. And what we saw was there was a lot of direct investment in those countries. So usually what we find is that investors around the world, they chase growth. They want to invest in countries that have high growth rates. And in those cases, you will have the highest amounts of direct foreign investment. The fourth one is tax rates. So whenever a foreign government has a high tax rate, it means that foreign investors are going to be less inclined to invest in their securities okay? because you know they will have to pay high taxes on their investments. The fifth one is exchange rates and what we are saying is that let's say the euro is quite weak now if you expect the euro to appreciate over the next year or two what that means is that investors in the US might be invest interested in investing more in those countries and in this case if the currency appreciates by 10 percent they are going to get an extra 10 percent about what they put in. So that's the reason why exchange rates can affect the direct foreign investment. And what we see here is that this graph basically tells you the distribution of global direct foreign investment across regions in 2007 and 2008. So what we find here is that uh, a lot of the direct foreign investment took place in the US. Uh, it's around 17 percent. The rest of Europe is 28.59. Uh, UK is 11, Germany is 8.2, France is 11.39, and so on. So the places where a lot of the direct foreign investment took place was in the US. Now, why does it take place? The first is that could be consistent with what we said. So the US economy was weak, US companies, the valuations were down, which meant that foreign investors would be very interested in buying some of those assets or investing in some of those companies. The second is that the US dollar was weak, but people expect the economy to turn around. So if you are a foreign investor, that is a good time to invest. Now, what about factors affecting international portfolio investment? The first one is tax rate on interest or dividends. So the higher the tax rate, the less people might be interested. The second one is interest rates. So if interest rates are high, foreign nationals want to buy those securities that could be investment in bonds and so on. The third is exchange rates and as you said before if the currency is weak and expected to appreciate chances are there could be higher international portfolio investments. Okay. Now exhibit 28 that basically tells you the effect of allowing foreign investors to buy US bonds how it affects the interest rates and the demand for the bonds. So the first uh, graph which you have here is supply and demand curve. So the demand curve is downward sloping. Okay, And the supply curve only if US investors were allowed to buy the bonds of the US is S1. So whenever the points, the demand curve and the supply curve uh, intercept, the interest rate is I1 and it tells you the amount of funds that can be raised by the US government. And what we see here is that at that point, the <coughs> interest rates are quite high. And the reason being that there is less demand for US bonds because only US investors can buy those bonds. <coughs> and in this case, the because the demand is less, interest rates are higher and the interest rate would be I1. On the other hand, if foreign nationals can also invest in those securities, 
the, uh, the supply curve is going to go down to S2. And in this case, the interest rate would be I2. So the benefit is that for the U.S. government, they can sell more bonds and there is going to be a higher demand for those bonds. And for the U.S. government, the benefit is that they can keep the interest rates sufficiently low. Okay. So that is, you know, one of the reasons why the U.S. encourages foreign nationals. Now, we have a lot of investment in U.S. bonds by Japanese uh, investors, also by investors in China. And by allowing them to invest in the securities, the benefit is for the U.S. government, they can keep their borrowing costs low. And for U.S. businesses, whenever the U.S. government rates are lower, it also means that the interest rates uh, at which they have to pay is also going to be lower. So that's one of the reasons why what we find that there's a strong demand for U.S. bonds. And we also find that overall the treasury interest rates are low and the borrowing rates, whether it's to take a mortgage or to invest in any other company and so on, they also tend to be low. Now, the last thing is we want to talk about the agencies that facilitate the international trade flows. So what are some of the agencies? The main agencies are the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the International Financial Corporation, the International Development Association, and Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Finally, we have the regional development agencies. Now, what is the purpose here? The purpose here is that for the International Monetary Fund, their objective is they act as a bank. They try to help countries that have financial problems. So whenever they find that a country has serious financial problems, they step in. They are willing to lend these countries money. And in turn, what the International Monetary Fund typically tries to do is that they urge these countries to make changes that can help them survive and also avoid such a crisis. Okay. Now, the World Bank, what they try to do is that their role is very similar, but uh, sometimes, you know, they not only fund help uh, countries, they can also help projects that are in different countries. So, for example, a uh, the government of India wants to build a dam, chances are they might be able to get financing from the World Bank. A third example is World Trade Organization. So what is the role of the World Trade Organization? The main role of the World Trade Organization is to ensure that uh, trade is fair and trade is free between countries. And usually what happens is that whenever uh, there is uh, a dispute between countries, the World Trade Organization steps in and tries to stop that thing. They try to act as a mediator to resolve this crisis. Okay, so this is the end of chapter two. Uh, so basically here we talked about the balance of trade. We talked about the components of the balance of trade. And we also talked about some of the factors that influence the balance of trade. Please make sure you know you complete the assignment related.